Welcome back to my YouTube channel, or I should say now our YouTube channel, now that Sam has uh, started posting some videos. Um, make my collar correct before I get on camera, right? This video is a continuation of the Halo PSA uh, playlist, where we're doing going through the onboarding and setup. And so far we've gotten uh, part of the way through billing. We've talked about um, contracts and billing templates, where contracts are used for covering labor and uh, billing templates apply which labor gets covered and which ones go to invoicing. And so the second half of that is the actual uh, billing of the contract to build essentially the recurring invoice and talk through um, that entire setup. Now, it's been a while since I've looked at this uh, instance that we're gonna be using. We're using the Rising Tide training instance like we had before. So let me jump right into it. And we're gonna talk about um, some of the things that we've done so far and the reasons where we got to so far today and why we needed to get there uh, so that we can continue what we're doing. So number one, we talked about the org setup. We talked about teams and agents permissions. We talked about our integrations with CSP. Um, we should have, I believe, connected our Ninja integration for our asset sync. So we got Microsoft CSP connected. Um, we have the users that we've imported. If we go take a look, I'm just going to flip our integrations view to show active features only. If you didn't know that existed, by the way, uh, I just found out today there are some long-term consultants who still uh, haven't known that feature. So this is something that we can use to narrow down like what's been set up so you can easily find it. We're going to go into Ninja One, just make sure that um, we are mapped. And we should have assets here. So if we go take a look at our assets, um, we can just jump to all assets, but we should definitely have some things here for Mendy Online, perfect. And let's keep going. All right, so we got our users in from CSP. Um, if we jump over to our user list, we're gonna hide general users and agent users, and we should have a couple people uh, that we imported. Um, what's odd is that I was hoping for more. Let's just see, there's no way this is still working, right? Let's just see if we can get away without it or um, if we can import just to fill up more of those. Let's see what happens. Okay, nope. It's long dead. That's fine. We'll just work with the users that we have. But the key is, is that also at this point, we'd want to have your integrations for Pax8 or whatever other distributor that you have set up. And essentially, we're building up what we're going to be using for what's called automatic quantity, quantity calculation on the recurring invoice. So we mentioned before, contracts are used for covering time. Labor that gets put into Halo that we want to, we want to make sure is included or not billed for. It's not invoiced for specifically. Um, I'm actually going to create some definitions right now that I may have gone over in a previous video. I don't necessarily remember, but we're just going to reiterate them just in case. Uh, there are four types of essentially billing plans that we define that we can use. One is whether or not we want to invoice it, which means that we're going to generate a brand new invoice. Uh, number two is we're going to decide not to invoice it completely, at which point we're writing off that time, that labor on a ticket. Number three is whether it's covered by a contract. And so therefore we don't need to invoice it because the contract has already been paid for some other alternative method. And then number four is going to be whether it's, uh, it's coming out of a prepay bucket. Um, essentially, they've given you a retainer. That retainer can either be a dollar amount value or a number of hours that are covered automatically. And we're going to pull the equivalent off of that whatever capture time was and apply it to the prepaid bucket. So the reason why we're defining these again, we've talked about those four methods under the billing plan, under the billing plan combination, is because all three of them, essentially, besides for the don't invoice, so the remaining three, really, are technically considered billable whether or not it's covered by a contract or whether or not it's invoiceable or whether or not it's going to prepay, it's all billable against the client account. And so we're gonna start using the term billable when we're talking about time that's covered by a contract or time that's not covered by a contract and actually invoiceable. And so the new line we wanna create, the new boundary it's gonna say whether or not we're creating an invoice for it is by saying whether it's invoiceable, not necessarily whether it's billable because billable time includes contract time that's covered and it doesn't mean we're gonna make an invoice for it. So we just wanna be clear on what that terminology is as we continue moving forward. When we talk about contracts, the contracts themselves are not linked to a dollar amount that you're pulling in, right? The contract, like I said, is just determining whether or not that billable time is gonna be covered or whether or not it's gonna be uh, invoiced. 
And so the actual revenue, the actual income that we're going to collect for that contract is going to be defined against the recurring invoice that we're going to create. And that's mostly what we're talking about today in this video. Um, moving in, moving on, we want to make sure that our items exist. We've talked about certain items before. We've talked about connecting it to QuickBooks Online. We want to make sure that we've got some recurring products here so that we have the ability to actually put these onto uh, the recurring invoice. Now, one of the problems that we're going to have potentially is that when we have an accounting package connected to the system, uh, the recurring invoice selection is the recurring item selection on a recurring invoice is going to be limited to those items that have actually synchronized to your accounting package. And in this case, even though we did connect QuickBooks Online, I don't think we've actually imported any items to QuickBooks Online at this point. Normally, what would happen is your item catalog would already exist in QuickBooks and we would import it from QuickBooks into Halo and then organize it out. In this case, it's brand new. We did a brand new trial. I didn't go through and create or update these items, so I didn't push it back to QuickBooks. In the event you want to start from a brand new clean product catalog, you can essentially not import from QuickBooks. Turn on the synchronization of items. So if you go to configuration and go to integration and jump into QuickBooks Online, then what we'll see is inside the entities to sync section, we have the ability to define products as one of the items that we want to synchronize. And with that being on, any item that we update or create inside of Halo at this point will be pushed across to QuickBooks Online and create that item inside of QuickBooks Online. So that's one of the things that you want to make sure that you're doing. Either you import the items here from QuickBooks to uh, Halo, or you set this up and you create all of your items in Halo, pushing them to QuickBooks real time, basically building out your product catalog in QuickBooks at that point. In this case, for today, um, one of my people, Sam, I guess, <laughs> call him out. You know him. He's on a video before. He's going through uh, Halo testing on another instance, and he uh, took over our QuickBooks <laughs> online tenant as of this moment. So we can't actually utilize, if you noticed on the items tab, these are not populating. We actually can't utilize QuickBooks online today to create items or anything like that. So I actually want to turn this off, and we want to back out and just disable the QuickBooks online integration just so that we don't have a problem uh, with um the items being selected on the recurring invoice so that's just something to keep in mind but when you are building out your recurring invoice if you happen to know there's a recurring item in halo and it doesn't show up on the list it's probably because it has not been synchronized to your accounting package so go ahead and check that uh, before you panic about items missing all right another thing that you may show up or you may run into is that if you go to your items page notice that in items by group we have essentially these groups and you may realize or determine that there's going to be products that don't show up in any of these lists and you're maybe thinking well i imported them from quickbooks why don't they show up well some of the reason and this happens more particularly with the zero than with quickbooks but one of the reasons for that is because when you imported the item a group does not have to be specified and so the item may not exist in any single group you can come here click on items by group switch to all items and you'll be able to see all items at that point including if you sort by group which ones are not in a group and then go through and fix those sorting them to a group Halo does require the items to be inside of a group for certain functionality, and you may run into some strange behavior if you don't have items, every item in a group, things with consignment failing, generating invoices failing from consignment in the event. Um, uh, it'll throw a message like no invoice lines to be created or something like that. And so we want to make sure that all items you have are a part of a group if you've imported it from an accounting package as well. All right, so now that we've talked a lot about uh, pre-introductory foundational work regarding Halo. Let's talk about the actual recurring invoice that we want to build. All right, so let's go into our customer that we're built talking about. In this case, we've been working with the Mendy Online customer. Uh, so we'll go ahead and jump into that. And we can see that we've got, just as a recap, we've got our sites and users here. We've got a couple of users. No, we got no users. We'll create a couple of them. <laughs> we've got um, our contract created. And so this is our unlimited professional MSP contract, basically, um, which is a certain tier that we've worked through with the billing template applied, right? So if you go to our billing tab and go to our billing template, we should have the billing rules created. Um, did I, yeah, here's the MSP billing plan, right? So that'll be the actual billing plan. Uh, the, the billing template is now applied, <laughs> assigning those rules to this client. And you can see how, based off of the type of, contract it was the different rules applied came down right if you need a refresher and go back and watch the previous video um, and if we look at our 
uh, billing template, we can see what that looks like. Again, just to kind of rehash, it has been a while since we talked about it, um, but you can see we've got different rules here, different ones apply to different contracts based off contract type. One of the things that we want to turn off, um, I guess a quick sidetrack here is uh, Halo recently announced the latest release candidate. And so that's going to be 2162. At this point, it's the new release candidate. It just came out today or just was announced today. It, that means currently the release candidate is going to go through some rapid testing. It's going to build out essentially probably by from past behavior around 10, 15, maybe 20 or so builds as it goes through revisions and code tracking and before it goes out to a uh, stable release. And so currently, this is the stable version, uh, 152. And we're going to go through about seven or eight versions to 162. I guess it's 10 versions to 162 before um, for the next stable, which means that you're going to be getting about 95 to 100 or so net new functionality from each of these versions that came out, right? Um, one of these things that, I, that you're going to be getting is the ability to say for the billing template to not create a contract. This is new. By default, it will create a contract. We want to turn this off and say save. And so now when we apply the billing template across the board, if there is no contract, none will be created. The billing template will only work if a contracts exist first, which is what we want. We don't want those contracts to be created. Normally speaking, in the typical MSP, um, you know, we don't want those contracts being created out of order. We want the contract to be created first and then apply the billing template um, because there are going to be certain things we want to have done on that contract uh, first. Now, with this unchecked, we don't have to worry too much about that. We can create, we can apply the billing template first and then apply the contract. The rules won't necessarily take effect. We'll have to go back and update the clients after that. But essentially, like that's what we want to do in the order. We want to have, we want to make sure the contract that gets created is the right type and with the right settings. We don't want to use this to create it for you, for us. Um, with that being said, let's go back. I promise we'll do a video on new features and functionality in the upcoming stable at some point. But right now, uh, let's go back and get on target for what we're going for. Let's close this out, close this out, and close this out. And let's go back and take a look at our next step, which is the recurring invoice, right? So we don't have that created yet. We haven't really talked about recurring invoices at this point, which is what we'll do now. A recurring invoice is basically a template that we're going to tell Halo uh, to create on a schedule an actual invoice. It's going to generate a real invoice off of the template that we create, and it's going to do that off of a certain schedule. Um, one of the things that uh, you want to know when it comes to generating invoices is that Halo has the pre-generated invoice section uh, where it's called ready for invoicing. Essentially, anything that you have here on the invoicing screen uh, on this invoicing area, anything that you have below this ready for invoicing is basically items or invoices that are pending creation that do not exist yet, but they exist to create, basically. And so one of those things is the recurring invoice which will allow us to generate a recurring invoice. We can see some of them here from existing out of the box examples. This will generate invoices off of a period um, automatically, or at least put it, uh, generate an invoice, generate a, a, a pre invoice to be created in the scheduling area so that we can come in here and generate these invoices uh, on a recurring basis. And these will basically include items on the invoice that are generally a contract or licensing or things like that. One of the things that you should know is that when the recurring invoice runs, or technically whenever you do any kind of invoice run, you have the ability to roll up other invoices for that same client into a single invoice. Um, sometimes it's good, sometimes it's bad. And so there's a lot of flexibility regarding that. We're not gonna dive too much into that area, but the thing to know is that when we are creating a recurring invoice, we have the ability on the side to essentially say any outstanding labor or items issued, or project labor, or prepay. Essentially, project charges could also be items issued under projects and stuff like that, um, or milestone billing, or things like that. Prepay invoices that are, have yet to be actually generated, and outstanding hardware sales order invoices um, as well. We can basically roll all those up, and so that way, when this runs, it'll create groups for each section and roll up all outstanding line items into a single invoice to the client. Some people like that, some people don't like that, it's up to you, but the idea is, is that it exists and it can be used. The other thing about this is that um, if you were to create two recurring invoice templates under a single client, 
and there is a period or a day when both templates are scheduled to create together, right? So if you have like one weekly, one monthly, every month the weekly happens to fall out on that month a period as well. Like on the first, uh, that weekly invoice also generates because it's the same uh, happens. Let's say, let's just back up and be more specific. Let's say you have a weekly invoice set to run every Monday and you have a monthly invoice set to run on the first. If the first is a Monday, is a Monday and the time for that generation is the exact same time, then we could roll up both invoices together into a single invoice for that period. And then the next month, the first is a Sunday. So the weekly invoice happens on a Monday the next day. Um, so the concept of rolling up items into a single invoice exists for across recurring invoice templates just as much as it exists from a recurring invoice template to other uh, types of invoices as well. So just something to keep in mind with that. Let's go ahead and start building it out, right? So we've got our, our client selected here. We've got a site we can limit it to, or we can say all, or we can ignore it. We can link it to a contract. Um, for the simple MSPs, if you have one contract, one recurring invoice, essentially we do want to link it to a contract. This is gonna be the way that we can tie the labor costs to the revenue. So we can show back profitability based off cogs of time spent. Um, so it's not required that you link it, and you can do it after the fact. If you're not worried, if you're not sure, just leave it alone. But essentially, we do want to create a link at some point from the revenue coming in to the contract expense of labor. And that's how we create your gross margin and profitability. So uh, if you do have one contract, one recurring invoice, you can just link it now. Otherwise, don't worry too much about it until later. Um, we're not going to talk about anything else at this point yet. We're just going to jump right into building our recurring invoice. So uh, if you've already been playing around with Halo, this kind of stuff is pretty easy. You just add recurring items. You'll see the list of recurring items that exist. You can basically add one from each or the ones that make a difference. And as you add them, you'll notice that they show up down here. So you can see what you've selected. And you can hit select and it'll basically add them all to the recurring invoice. Now, there's a couple of behavior changes here or a couple of behavioral differences you may notice than what we have running. I'm going to go ahead and just cancel this. I'm actually going to trash them and save. I actually do want to save this. So I'm going to save this. We're going to get uh, no schedule has been set. This is because we haven't yet created a schedule. Keeping in mind, this is a template that runs off the schedule. If there is no schedule, the template will never run. And so therefore the real invoice will never create. So this error message alone is not too bad. Doesn't really mean much. This is also saying there's no lines, which makes sense. We deleted all of them. And so the invoice will never be created. Notice these are two different error messages. One of the things Halo will do is if you get more than one prompt or error in response to an action that you're doing for the same exact action, Halo will actually coalesce or combine the messages together and give you a single prompt. Instead of clicking OK two times, you'll just click it once to move on. So just keep that in mind. Keep, be aware of those messages as they pop up. In this case, the behavior differences that we're talking about, if we go to configuration, and I think it's under quotations, we have add all line items um, at once or something like that. Uh, I don't know where that is. That's not. Right, let's try this again. Um, I think it's in here. It could be in a different area. And I'm just, let's go to, now I'm not going to know where it is if it wasn't there. Uh, Let's think about this. If it's not under quotations, it could be under um, it could be under recurring invoices, technically speaking, but I don't think it's there because that doesn't um, this is not just on recurring invoices. It should be affecting sales orders, quotations, and regular invoices as well. So it could be under sales orders. Uh, which is the same settings as quotations in some cases. So it's not here. Um, is it under, is it under items, stock control, general settings? Let's see. Uh, items and stock control. 
delivery site account. No. All right. Well, uh, I'm losing my mind because it should be. Invoice creation settings. We already we already looked at this one. Um, yeah, so this is going to be some of those things that we, that we were just talking about merging, right? So when we're grouping invoice lines together, one of the things that I recommend doing for ticketing is to group by charge rate, ticket um, and charge rate, so that we know which ticket had happened on and what the charge rate was spent, so that we don't create basically a labor invoice item of a million lines. We also want to group project ones by essentially a header for each project and a line for each budget type or group by ticket and rate as well. One of those two potentially. Again, we don't really want to kill. The thing with Halo is that time entries are basically individual actions that are occurring. And we don't really want to throw a million line items on the invoice, which could cause you know a seven page or eight page invoice to show up when really we could roll that all up into, um, into a two or three line based off charge rate done for that ticket. We still want to potentially add reports of what time was done, like show the individual actions. So we can build a report for that separately. That looks a lot nicer than building an invoice of, you know, a hundred or so line items on there. Um, in the event uh, we're grouping the invoice, we're rolling invoices up, we can go ahead and add a group header for each billing type, basically. And then we can um, decide whether or not we want to merge sales orders into one invoice per client. Um, otherwise, uh, all the sales orders will generate independently. But if we do do it per client, we can still separate it out by site at that point. Um, instead of per client, it will we'll generate per site. So that's something that you may decide you want to do. If the client's like, well, we want to know which hardware was ordered or invoiced for what site, you can go ahead and turn that on. Um, at this point, I'm still looking for the setting that I uh, look at, that I that I know exists. I just don't remember where it is, or I missed it under the quotation side. Let's go back and take a look at it one more time. Uh, hide quotes. Nope. Um, include, there's a lot of settings here that we do want to change, and we'll go through it when we get to the quoting side of Halo. And so maybe we just leave this alone for right now. Oh. Uh, don't show the edit screen after selecting items to add. So turning this on, and I, now that I think about it, it may only if may not even impact recurring invoices. I don't know if recurring invoices even does that. So that setting may be irrelevant. But if we are to build, let me just show you the behavior differences. If we go to a quote, for example, really quickly, and I know we're tangenting really badly at this point. If we pick a client and add an item, what will happen uh, normally is um, let's go ahead and turn this off really quickly and then just refresh this page. What will happen normally when we do that is it's going to ask for, hey, what information about the item do you want to change before you go ahead and add it to the quote? And so that setting, what it will do is it will actually skip that screen and just add them all in. So if we were to go ahead and add the item, it just throws it directly in and we can go back and edit it later. So certain people prefer a certain type of behavior. And now that I'm thinking about it, I don't even remember if the recurring invoices uh, gives you that edit screen or if I was just chasing that, chasing that setting for quotations. But either way, um, as of right now, we just added those items. It did not even prompt us to edit. It just added them in directly. So there may be an equivalent setting for recurring invoices or something like that. If you notice that behavior, you can go looking for it. Um, but the next thing that we want to do is if you've noticed, uh, these pricing that we're talking about is actually giving us currency in gross British pounds, which um, we're in America. Uh, I'm in America, at least, and I'm assuming, uh, which is probably not a great assumption, but most of you are probably in America. Most of my audience are probably in America. Uh, so we want to change this. Um, but more importantly, if you already had your currency set to a certain value, and then you were to mess with the accounting package, what that does is it resets the currency. And so you want to go and just verify that the currency is set correctly. There are two things about this. under the configuration billing general settings, if you go to currency section, notice we have multiple currencies are on. What we want to see, generally speaking, what you'll see out of the box primarily is this is unchecked and the current the default currency set to the dollar value or whatever your um, currency uh, symbol is at the at this point. However, if you go and mess with your accounting package, and so if we go ahead and notice I, I saved this, if I refresh, you'll see that this currently is 
set the way we want it to be. If I go back to our billing and we turn QuickBooks Online on, go back out, try it one more time. Go to QuickBooks Online and turn it on, right? And then we just wait, refresh or whatever, go ahead and turn it off, which is basically where we were now. And then go back to our billing general settings and refresh the page, go look at our currency. You'll notice that our multiple currencies are on again. And so this is generally something that you should be aware of if you were to mess with your accounting package. You're not crazy. It literally changes the currency, turns the multiple currency back on. And out of the box, no matter where you are, the multiple currencies do not get configured for your region. Um, normally, they just turn this off and they set the symbol. But in this case, multiple currencies are still, if they were to be enabled, still use the gross British pounds. And turning it off reverts it back um, at this point. So what we want to do is go into here, edit this, and say our default currency is actually United States dollar. This is a dollar symbol, and this is USD. And our conversion rate is always going to be one relative to the default currency, right? Because that's going to be the, the rate we're going to be using. And then any other rate we add in, it'll do a lookup and create a conversion rate off of that default value. And so now if we go back to our general settings and go to currency, you'll see that our multiple currencies are using gross are using US dollar instead of gross British pounds. And the only thing I haven't actually tried before, and I'm not sure what's going to happen, is if I go ahead and mess with the accounting package one more time, is it going to wipe out my changes or is it going to just revert back to multiple currencies with US dollars? And we're going to find out right now. I just turn on QuickBooks Online. Now I'm going to go ahead and turn it back off again. And let's go back and refresh our screen and see what it looks like. We are still in the US dollars. And if we uncheck this, we're still in the US dollar symbol. So that's good. We're going to go ahead and keep it off. We want the, we, we don't need multiple currencies. It just overly complicates things right now. So we're going to keep that off. But that's something that you should be aware of. So we fixed our currency at this point, And now we are ready to start building our recurring invoice. One of the things that we just showed you before to build our recurring invoice is we can go ahead and add our items. We're going to take you through some steps that will make the creating recurring invoice a little bit simpler uh, for us, right? So let's say that this is Mendy Online. It's a real customer. We're building it out according to our wiki, and we actually want to create a, um, a contract or a recurring invoice for this customer to be billed for so they can be covered for IT services. So in this case, um, I know as an MSP, I've got a few things. I am a CSP, indirect CSP through Pax8 or SureWeb or whatever other distributor you may be using. I have support services that I offer that are charged per workstation and per server. I may have a location connection fee or network management fee or something like that that's going to be flat. Um, and then I also have my licensing, which can be a mixture of licensing configured or build based off number of devices or number of users at this point. I'm not going to go through all of the different various ways of packaging um, the products. This is not an MSP consulting video. <laughs> this is just a Halo setup video. And I'm not going to go through all the ver various different ways that we can do it. Just so you should know as a discussion point, or we can have this conversation one-on-one -on -one if you want to reach out. Um, I prefer when we bill uh, a client, we're not hiding so much um, what's within a package. You can still build your stack and, and sell your stack within a packaged item, but it's easier and less overhead and more transparent, and you can build a stronger, more trustworthy relationship with the client if you show them what's behind the curtain. I'm not saying you need to show them all the different products that you're using. You can brand the products if, if you like and put something behind it. But if they know everything that they're getting, number one, if you break it out per item, you can actually call out this quantity item is based off of workstations. This quantity item is based off of users. They can see the differences and they see it roll up independently. And you don't have to worry about somehow merging two different uh, types of costs together under a single item that they then have to um, take you at face value for or something like that, right? It, the, it removes a lot of the figuring out and overhead that exists. Um, so in this case, we're going to go ahead and start building out a recurring invoice. I know we've got essentially two groups. My client wants those groups broken out, potentially. Even um, some of those groups may exist with a um, billing for the current month, and some of them may exist billing for the previous month. So generally speaking, we just want to go through what that would kind of look like. So I'm going to go ahead and add a new group at this point. The new group that we're adding in, uh, is going to be, we're, we're going to call this, you know, um, MSP Advisors, right? I think that's what we called. I think it's the company name, right? MSP Advisors, the MSP name. And then we'll say Support Services. And then now that I have my group, any item that I add into this group at this point is going to add, any item that I add to the recurring invoice to this point is going to automatically be added to the latest group that was created. And so if I come in here and I say, well, I've got my 
contract. In fact, I, I'm actually missing. Uh, here's a managed services charge, right? So let's say I've got um, uh, for 250 a month, I've got my servers. We're going to add that in. And we're going to go add a next one as well. I'm going to use the same exact item. And I'm going to say for, um, uh, uh, let's say, 115 a month, we're going to say these are workstations. And then we're going to do a flat rate for our network management. And that's going to be 200 for network connectivity um, at this point, right? So notice that each one that I'm adding is automatically coming into the group. And I'm going to keep going. I'm going to add a new group. And we're going to say third-party licensing. And we're going to go ahead and start adding our next recurring items into it. So here we've got we've got business premium, business standard. We potentially have a domain renewal. Um, you know, we have our SSL wildcard or whatever. And these are really bad examples, right? What we'd really want to see is essentially security services, Huntress, Iron Scales, uh, you know, uh, Threat Locker, Auto Elevate, those kinds of services that you'd be charging for monthly that vary based off device or user essentially. And that's really what we'd want to see. But the point is to showcase how adding those items will fall under the next group that we just created. And so it removes a lot of the going back and forth that may exist um, when building out your invoice, right? Another trick that we'll go through is if we come in here, notice like I've got three managed services. This is not helpful. I need to go start actually building out what, what this is. So we can say, you know, a managed server support charge. And then I'm just going to copy this, paste that here, and we'll keep going. My group is already configured, but my quantity is actually going to be a quantity calculated based off of asset. And this is going to be the magic. It's going to tie the numbers. And I'm going to come in here and I'm going to say based off asset types that are server, billable server, essentially, um, or something like that, whatever type we want. Or I can say, you know what, all the different servers that are billable are going to be under the servers group. So I'm just going to go based off assets in that servers group. And then we can also add additional quantity free or minimum quantity parameters and things like that. We can limit it by site. If we want to build out different per site lines, um, we can set our Pareto lines. In this case, um, we don't want to, um, we don't want to invoice or prorate uh, changes on here. So we're just going to go ahead and exclude changes from the next invoice. Um, So that way, I think uh, I think this is what we'll do. So it won't actually prorate. Now, there's a bug currently that if you choose any option except for the top one, the criteria kind of goes away. That bug should be fixed at some point. But the criteria allows us to specify additional value uh, filtering to say only include this or asset in the account if a certain field has a specific value. Um, right, if SLA is equal to, you know, incident or 24 hour or whatever, that means we're covering that workstation with an SLA. So therefore we're going to charge for that with that SLA or something like that. Let's go ahead and add this quantity in. I don't know if we have anyone in the servers group, so we'll have to take a look at that. We can come in here and set our price. In this case, it's choose value, but we do have the ability to calculate based off assets or users on the contract if we want to, um, at which point we'll, uh, it'll ask us to basically um, we'll have to make sure the contract is linked at that point on the recurring invoice so that it, it can uh, calculate from there. But for the most part, this price is usually going to be what we want to use it for um, based off of choose value. Or if we are um, linking it to a license or subscription, we can change the price to be calculated off of a um, here. By adding the subscription, we can update the unit price and cost based off of the linked subscription that we're doing. Um, you know, and I really have no idea how that's going to work when it comes to uh, if you add more than one subscription to this rule, and then each one has a different pricing. I don't know what that's going to look like. So I don't know why they did that here instead of putting it in here with everyone else, but that's a different conversation. In this case, we'll go back to asset. We'll keep our rule here. Let's go ahead and save this. Now, here's the trick that I was mentioning or alluding to earlier, is that I can scroll all the way down and hit save if I want to, but I also don't have to. This is essentially a form. And as of right now, if I'm on a field that's not a multi-line text, if I'm here and I press enter, it's gonna go to the next page. But if I'm here, here, or even on a group, if I press enter, it's going to save the changes that I've made at that point, um, submitting that. So some a quick change, if I come in here and I'm just modifying essentially this description, and I were to say managed workstation, you know, 
uh, supported workstation charge or something like that. If I can type. And I control control C, control V, click, come back here and press enter. It's going to submit it automatically. Um, yeah, so this is different wording. Let's go ahead and fix that. Managed workstation support charge. And we'll make sure that looks the same. And then we want to come in here and do the same thing. Choose our automatic quantity calculation by asset, where that asset is going to be a group of laptops and workstations, essentially, or something like that, right? So we really want to start planning our assets for quantity calculation. Like that's when we that's what we want to keep in mind when we start building out our and syncing our assets through. The reason why we did that first and we go through our integration first is because when we build this out, we want to make sure the quantity is coming correctly. Um, now, if you're an existing MSP billing for a quantity and you go ahead and set that up, what should happen is the quantity you're already billing for in your existing invoices should already be linked and matched to your um, to your quantity count, your asset count from your RMM. And so theoretically speaking, these numbers should already match correctly. Uh, if once you sync it through, this should be pretty close, or this would be the real number you really want to bill for and not necessarily uh, the number that you've had on your previous invoice. So we've mentioned, we've noticed here that we actually aren't getting any assets into our list. So we want to come in here and take a look as to why not, right? So we've got essentially Linux server, Windows server. We want to know which group these are in. So let's go take a look at um, asset by asset type. And we've got Windows Server here. We've got three here under Mendy Online. We've got Workstation. No, nope. we've got, let's see. Um, Windows Build Server has one uh, Linux desktop laptop. Uh, no, where are, let's go back to all assets and take a look at some other of the other types. We've got VM Host. We've got Linux desktop. I guess I don't really have any. Uh, I've got Windows laptop here. I guess I don't really have any real workstations per se, but let's take a look at these groups of the assets to figure out why it's not coming to the invoice. If we go to configuration and go to asset management, um, the asset types will fall into a group. And so let's go to look at the asset type, for example, of workstation, and we want to make sure that's under laptops and workstations. If we go back and go to Windows Server, we want to make sure that's under servers, for example, right? And if we want to go to Windows Laptop, we want to make sure this is also under laptops and workstations and save that. And then if we go to Windows Visual Server, it's going to go under the servers, essentially. And then just go through the rest of those really quickly. We've got server here, which is already under servers. We have Linux server, which you want to put under servers. And I guess we can just look at the ones that are under Ninja assets currently. Those are the ones you want to look at potentially moving, right? So the only one left is the uh, Linux desktop. And we can come ahead, go ahead here, and just move this under the laptops and workstations at this point. Um, so we've got VM guests and hosts, which are not real agents. These are um, the virtual machine detected stuff from Ninja. We don't really care about those. We've got the NMS. If we want to put that under like networking or switching or something like that, we can worry about that. Um, but at this point, this should give us everything that we're looking for in terms of our assets being within the right groups, and which means that our invoicing screen should be calculating automatically based off of the assets that are there, which will take a second to load because it does calculate it real time. And now we've got five servers, three workstations, and then we can come in here and say, this is our network support, right? Managed network support charge. And there's one network for this. And so we're gonna go ahead and just leave that as quantity one for it. We don't need to set this to an automatic quantity. But you could, if you had like Domo or Avic or something like that, you can link it to the number of sensors or something like that under the client, and then we can save that. And that's pretty simple. It's basically it as far as automatic quantity calculation goes. We kind of did talk about the um, licensing and subscription, but now we'll demo it for real on these individual ones. I'm actually going to change a couple of these. We're going to say this is going to be, um, you know, uh, let's see. Um, MSP advisors, security, uh, breach detection, right? And so that can be essentially Huntress. Um, we're going to come here and put that here. We're going to set our quantity to be linked based off of script subscription count, and or we can go based off license count, um, depending. So I actually have a YouTube video that walks through connecting to uh, Huntress's API, collecting the number of assets that are using Huntress, and then setting the license count there. So we can come in here and say, this license will use that. Um, we're going to come and uh, actually save this for a second. 
And I'm not going to show you the video. I'm not going to show the API. What I want to do, though, is we do have the ability to manually create those. So I can come in here and go to the software tab really quickly. Uh, software licenses and just build a Huntress license really fast. So we got here, we know we've got uh, five plus three is eight. So we can see there's eight essentially licenses that are used for Huntress. If we wanted to, we can populate the purchase price, which would be, I don't know, let's say it's 250. And the sell selling price we can say is about four or something like that. And then we can come in here and save this. And the idea is that now back on the recurring invoice, I can come back here and I can say, this is going to be linked to the Huntress license. And we are going to set the cost and price to that um, automatically. We also have a minimum quantity that we've decided that they have to be at, which is going to be at 10. So if during contract, we decide, hey, um, the minimum number of licenses, the, the number of negotiated people or, or supported devices or whatever it is that you're using on the contract is set to a specific number. We can lock it to that number to say it's not going below 10 until the next renewal period. So we can come in here and hit save and hit save. And what you'll see is that the $4 essentially was overrode the 20. And now we have a limit, a minimum of 10. So that's set by quantity. If I come in here and I change that minimum to say, you know what, it was actually five that we agreed on and hit save. We're gonna go ahead and hit save here. What you'll see is that that quantity will update to be eight because the way it works is that the Minimum quantity will make sure that you've met the minimum and anything extra uses the count from licensing. If that licensing count goes below that minimum, it's gonna lock it to that minimum. So that's one of the things that you can do with that. And that same concept applies for everything else that we're doing as well, right? So we've basically built out a recurring invoice at this point um, that we can use to generate uh, the invoice for on a monthly basis. And now we actually have to talk about the real schedule for a second. Okay, so with the schedule, um, we edit this and we're going to come and take a look at this, these settings right here, specifically in the schedule area. So we have the ability to set a schedule here. Right now, the schedule has not been set. And we also have the ability to decide what period we're building for. Here's a bug that exists, or maybe it's not a bug. Maybe it was a bug before that didn't do this. But one thing to know is if you try setting your invoice period um, mode without having a schedule, it's going to fail. So if I come in here and hit count period and hit save, you'll get an error message saying unable to save data. It's a pretty generic error. It hasn't really um, been built out to tell you why that's throwing that error message. But the reason is because there's no schedule and so the period can't be calculated. Um, one of the things it tries doing here is it calculates the next, creation, the next creation period when you change this period. And so doing that without a schedule will cause the uh, error message to occur um, and then it'll die. At this point, we want to set our period. So our period start date is a start date. That's something that's very important to keep in mind. This is not the start date of the schedule. It, it is the start date of the schedule, but it's primarily the start date of the period. And so we want this to be start date of June 1st, for example. In this case, we actually don't want June because we're way in September right now. So we actually want to do October to assume we've already billed September in a previous uh, invoice. If we don't change the date, it will allow us to create backdated invoices, which you don't want to do in this case. So we want to start as of October. I'm going to set this to be 9 a.m. Um, this time zone label, I don't know if they fixed it or not. Some people, I think, have reported it started working. But it may reflect your current local time zone and it not actually work that way. It may actually still generate it in UTC. So to play it safe, I always like doing 9 a.m., but it's completely up to you. Um, the idea is that we don't want that generating too early or too late. We actually want it generating during the day of when you want it to be generated. So uh, if we leave it alone in the CTC, it'll be generating in actuality in my time zone on September 30th, you know, or um, the wrong day. If I'm in uh, in Auckland and New Zealand or something like that, it could be generating it a day uh, behind instead of a day ahead, All right? So we want to make sure just to play it safe, either test it to make sure that the time zone is actually correct, that it's displayed here and actually works the way we want it to, or update the timestamp to be 9 a.m. It's not going to hurt you, I promise. Um, that 9 a.m. timestamp, by the way, is relative to based off the number of hours ahead or behind that you are, right? Because it is, you just see, so if 9 a.m. doesn't work, uh, you may want to do a different time depending on how many hours ahead or behind you are. Our repeat period, our repeat period is going to be monthly, and then the end date is going to be how long we're going to generate this for. Generally speaking, we're going to leave this blank unless they're not on an auto renewal period, right? Number of days ahead. So this is the part that actually matters in terms of making sure we generate the invoices 
ahead of the period start. So let's say uh, most MSPs, the middle of the month, they're generating the invoice, or towards the end of the last month, they're generating the invoice for the next month. And so in this case, this is what we do. We just say 10 days ahead or 15 days ahead. And so then basically in September 16th, we're generating the invoice for October 1st. So every month we can see it's generating on 17th or 16th, basically. Um, we can do it zero days, and then you'll see it generating on the first, right? So that's the first, as opposed to um, generating it in the middle of the last month. But we don't really want that. Normally we want like 10, 15, 12, something like that, so that we can actually see, um, we actually have the invoice get created in advance. We can go through review, make sure it's correct, and then send it out, right? With that being said, um, we do have the ability to mark that schedule active or inactive. This, for the most part, we'll leave alone. We're never going to change that unless we need to clear it, which we'll talk about at some other point in another video. And then we want this to create on holidays. We'll go ahead and save the schedule. Once that schedule is saved, we have the ability to now save this on the current period. And what we'll see, what we'll see is that that API error will not happen anymore. And our next period should be calculated correctly at this point uh, for October 1st to October 31st. All right, we're almost done at this point of the recurring invoices. Um, one of the things that we want to call out is these variables that get used here when we add them to the line item, if we add another item in here, you'll see it automatically adds the name plus it adds the recurring billing date. Um, this is not a helpful variable to use for the most part, and it is configurable for what we want it to say. So let's go to our, let's start closing these things out. Let's go to our configuration. And let's go back to um, billing, and we want to go to general settings, I believe. And then under invoice creation variables, we have the ability to define what these variables look like for these different types of things. And this is these two are the ones we want to pay attention to at this point, right? So one is our item description is the name, pretty straightforward. We have a list of variables right here we can click on, and it'll take us to our variables for it. And then we've also got the, the ability to look at our billing period uh, variables. So you can see that, what that looks like, or we can look at um, using essentially the period start date and end date. So we can actually create a range. So what we want to do over here is change this to look like this. Um, period at start date and then grab the end date and paste that here and close this off. And then we can copy this and replace this with that. The next question is, what do we want to show up on in the long description, right? So this is going to depend on a lot of factors. Um, number one, where are you sending invoices out of from? If they're going to go to QuickBooks and you're sending the invoices from QuickBooks, then primarily you want to make sure that the long items that appear inside of QuickBooks has all the information that you want it to have. If you're sending it from zero, same idea. One of the things that we can configure is the that um, if I just change this for a moment to show um, our setup here. So we're looking at invoice creation variables. Um, really what I want to take you to is zero. Inside of here, we have the ability to define when we're syncing to zero, uh, the ability to set whether or not which um, part of the invoice gets sent to zero to show up on the line item. Uh, details. And so QuickBooks Online has may not have the exact same setting, but it also has a specific um, configuration that either it may be hard-coded in, in which you can't change it, or maybe set that you can configure it in terms of what will show up on the recur on the invoice that's getting pushed from Halo. So if you're sending it from Halo, you want to make sure that the line description inside, I'm sorry, if you're sending it from QuickBooks or from Zero, you want to make sure that the line description on the invoice contains information about that item helpful to the client that you want them to see. If you're sending it from Halo, we have a lot more control over what that looks like. And so we have the ability to basically, under the PDF template, if I were to close this out and go back to our, um, I can just do it from here, I guess. If I go to our PDF templates and take a look at our edit invoice PDF templates, and we can actually configure what shows up on this description it's right now, it's the, by the, out of the box, it's a long description, but we can change that to be the short description, or we can do a custom column that'll say it's a combination of 
the long description and short description, right? Item BR and then sales description or something like that, right? So we can we can do whatever we want here with Halo to make to actually make it look um, really nice with a bold header or something like that and an explanation of what it is. But the key is, and the point that I'm getting to is under every item, we have the ability to define essentially a sales description in addition to the name. So the name may be helpful, but the sales description may give you an explanation of what's included or uh, what it comes with and so on and so forth. So we may have, um, let's go to business premium, for example. We may have here a sales description that says Microsoft 365, uh, Exchange plus Office plus uh, Security uh, Defender, right? Defender plus Azure, whatever. And you can basically write up a blurb about this item um, that'll show up a bullet point list of things that um, that it covers, what's included, and stuff like that. That'll show up, and then we want to take that sales description and just use it inside of the long description. So we can take this dollar variable go back to our configuration, billing, general settings, invoice creation, variables, and just change item description to basically be the sales description with that in there, right? Um, so it's just something to keep in mind. Like we can use the variables and these items, these fields to basically default how it's gonna look. If I go ahead and save this, for example, and I go to our invoice and we go ahead and refresh this, if I go add my next item in, uh, so I can say that next item is business premium, hit one and select, what's gonna happen is it's gonna add it here, right? And then notice the difference in this variable. And then if I go into it, notice that I now have this plus that, right? So it, lo it looks very different. It's, it's a very different experience. And again, it matters on where you're sending the invoice out of. If you're sending it out of Halo, we have a lot more flexibility in how this looks and what the customer can see. If we're sending it out of QuickBooks or zero, our flexibility is significantly less. Um, and so bottom line, like one of the things our goal to get to at some point is to make sure that you're always sending invoices out of Halo uh, and not out of QuickBooks or zero. Uh, but we'll, we'll talk about that at a later point in time. Um, the other thing is, is that play with these variables. You know, I'm not going to tell you what is best to use, but you can see based off what you choose, how you want it to look, um, and you have the ability to change what that looks like. So you want to do that before you build out all your recurring invoices because notice that the setting that I changed doesn't change it for any of these line items. We have to go through and delete all the line items or go update each one by one to reflect with the new formatting, which uh, I'm not going to do. So what I am going to do is I'm going to take this part of the variable and I'm just going to update the parts that we actually care about, right? So here I'm going to come back here and I'm going to change this like that. And then I'm going to go and go to the next one and we'll just do each of these, right? So that it's gotten, so it has like the actual range of the of the period that it's for. So we'll go through and update um, this as well. And we'll update this one. And we'll update this one too. All right, now some of you may be wondering like how come um yeah actually i don't know where i was going with that that's fine let's go ahead and save this um one of the things that we can do is we don't have to specify it per item we could also do it on the group level so we can say this is for uh that period right and then we don't have to put it under the individual line items and then we could be like well third party licensing is actually arrears it's not meant for the next period so we talked about that very briefly earlier Notice these variables, we actually do have uh, the ability to specify the previous period, start and end date. So I can come in here and say, well, really, for this group, this entire group is, hold on, I feel like I'm on the wrong tab. Uh, let's refresh this. Okay, I guess I'm not on the wrong tab. I guess I didn't save it. Um, I feel like I did, but okay. Let's just throw this back in here. Uh -oh. start date and end date, and fair start date and end date, and save that. And then we'll come in here. And in this case, I'm going to do previous period start date, and we actually want to put this in here, and then previous period end date. 
So we'll come back here and grab the end date and paste it in and close that up. And then we'll just grab this, control C, control V, and hit save there and save. Right now, I already added the previous period, the current period start and end date here. So these are going to be wrong, but I'm not going to bother fixing them. You get the point, right? Like if I if I were going to do this, I was either going to remove these variables from these lines completely, or I'd make them reflect the same previous period. And the goal that we want to get to before I close this video out at just under an hour is to create the invoice and see what it looks like. So at this point, if I go ahead and I go to the invoicing screen, um, so we'll do that here. I'll go to this tab and jump to the invoicing screen, and we go to the recurring invoices. We can see if I move this to October 1st and look at Mendy Online, we have an invoice here for $1,800 that we can generate for the period of October. I can click this box and hit Create Invoice, and then it will create that invoice for October 1st um, that will allow us to send it out at this point. So if you go ahead and wait for this to be generated, we can open that up and see what it looks like with the October, September timestamps. These still have October because we left them in here, but you can see the quantity came across correctly. The total amount is here and it's linked to this contract and we can now just go ahead and send it or generate the PDF to see what it looks like. Um, so that's basically it for recurring invoices as far as going through and making them manually. Um, there are a couple other things I guess I can squeeze in in the remaining four minutes that we can talk about. Uh, let me just pop this open. So we can take a look at this PDF. All right, so we've got now our nice branding here out of the box. We've got MSP Advisors logo. We've got the information here. We have the uh, address information here. And we're going to do a video about PDF templates, in which point we'll make this look much better. We'll come back and take a look at um, how to clean this up. It doesn't look bad already, but there are certain things we definitely want to clean up and remove. And then we can see the grouping that occurs here, um, right, and, and stuff like that. So we can see how that looks and then we can essentially i mean this is it this is your invoice we can send it out and and use that um all right so i i forgot about one thing that i did want to cover on this section that really would round up uh the recurring invoices so we're going to talk about that for a moment let's say our business premium licenses were nce and we are committed for a year contract but we are billing monthly what do we do in that scenario i, I talk about with contracts contracts exist for labor only to cover labor. We don't build a contract for annual commitments that they get stuck into, which is different from other PSAs potentially. And so in this case, how do we track that contract, so to speak, that we're in for NCE? And how do we know when it's time for renewal and have to have that discussion or take a look at it? This can be done using a combination of two functionalities. One of them is on the recurring invoice line item. If we were to say business premium is a annual contract and it's starting October 1st, we're gonna to go to the status section of the line item and we're gonna set the start date to be October 1st and the end date to be September 2025 30th, right? And so basically this is our 12 month period. We are gonna leave it on auto renew so that way it doesn't drop off the invoice automatically. Um, it'll just continue moving forward. And then uh, we can leave it active and send this. And notice that we save it, we're now gonna show it's not in date range, right? Um, because it doesn't actually start yet till October, uh, which is fine. But the key is this doesn't do anything by itself, right? This just does essentially one part of it. The second part of it, and it's going to dovetail a little bit into ticketing, so we're not going to go too much into it other than show you where it is. Um, we'll get back to it later when we actually do all the ticketing. But under, if we go to configuration, let's go to this screen and go to configuration and go to tickets, we have the ability to generate an automated ticket which is a ticket that occurs off of an event. And so we can come in here and build a new automated ticket that says recurring invoice line expiration, if I can type, right? And our automated criteria is gonna be recurring invoice lines. And here we'll say days before a line item end date. And let's say we have it set to 30. So like the month before it's set to expire, we're gonna go ahead and generate a new ticket. And this ticket type can be one of any of your normal ticket types. In this case, I'm just going to choose incident, but again, we'll talk about this later. And we can use these dollar variables inside of the ticket. So I'm just going to paste them in directly. And we're going to say dollar name is up for renewal at end date for dollar area, right? And that's basically our new ticket that's going to get created um, automatically when this, when this renewal occurs. So that 
that's going to give us the ability to have that conversation with the client, cal make sure that the number of quantities or the minimum quantities are all good. We've removed anything that we have to and so on and so forth. So that covers the NCE side and the reminder. We can create a report of line items that are expiring so we can essentially build a contract report or obligation of licensing report. Now, one of the things about this that exists, we kind of talked about this a little bit for uh, contracts expiring. If we were to change the criteria to be based off contract, we have the ability to bump the next call date automatically by a year when the next call date period comes up, right? So that automatically manages the contract. We don't have that functionality on recurring invoice lines today, but what's gonna happen in another version is we're gonna have the ability to, on the recurring invoice line item in that status section, to define the period that the status is for so that it can automatically bump the end date to the next period. If it's monthly, it'll bump it in a month. If it's annually, it'll bump it annually, and so on and so forth. So this does exist in a coming version that I don't remember if it's in the release candidate or a later version. Um, let's see if it's here. Uh, okay, it's not there. Is it in here? Yes. So auto renew period can now be set, right? So it's actually going to be in the next stable version that's coming out very shortly. We'll have the ability to, uh, after the initial start date and end date of a recurring invoice line has passed, and if the line item is set to auto renew, the end date cannot be automatically adjusted based off the period at the line level rather than the recurring invoice level. So here we can set the auto renew period to be monthly or whatever, so that way it just bumps out that period automatically at this point. All right, so that's the last part to wrap it up um, as far as recurring invoicing goes. What we wanna do in coming videos is we wanna cover PDF templates so we can cover the design feel of the invoice uh, when it goes out. And then finally, we wanna take a step back and be like, how do we do this? in bulk. I've got 20 clients, I've got 20 contracts, I've got 20 recurring invoices. How do we build this out in bulk to make sure that I don't have to spend a lot of manual time doing it? So we're gonna cover the actual spreadsheet imports. I was hoping to get to it in this video. So I had this set up essentially to show through like the, the, the templates to import and what we can do to actually import them into Halo. But at this point, um, the video's at an hour long. So I just crossed the threshold that I was trying to stay at and uh, we didn't have time to get to it. So it'll be on the next video before we move off of building completely. All right, thank you for watching. I hope this is helpful. Leave your comments and feedback below and don't forget to like and subscribe.